Let every eye be fixed upon King Jesus. Let every tribe and tongue prepare the way. Let every heart be filled with expectation. Because the King is coming. The King is coming. Open the doors up. Yes. Come let the light in. People get ready. People get ready. Get ready to worship Him. Ready to worship Him. Open the doors up. Open the doors up. Oh, yes. Come let the light in. People get ready. People get ready. We bow down this bow morning. Bow down and worship Him. We're singing.
The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When darkness falls, it won't prevail. The God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. morning every war he wages he will win and I'm not backing down from any giant oh no I know how the story ends yes I know how the story ends I'm gonna I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory
But the perfect Son of God in all his innocence You're walking in the dirt with you and me He knows what living is Is acquainted with our grief A man of sorrow, son of suffering Blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of Son. Distant and removed, but the chase is down and merciful pursuit. To the sinner you were grace, the broken you embraced, and in the end the proof is in your wounds. You see the end the proof. Oh, praise the 
is hallelujah to the son of suffering. Say hallelujah to the son of suffering. Hallelujah to the son of suffering. Say hallelujah to the son of time at Bonita Valley, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. If you want some info on BVCC, simply complete our online connect card. Here's how it works. Scan the QR code you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you with the camera on your smartphone. Open the link that will take you to connect card. You'll find a number of connecting options, including first time guests, prayer requests, I want some info on a Bonita Valley ministry check the appropriate connection box you're after. Push submit and we'll get back to you ASAP. If you're a first time guest today, please stop by Guest Central at the end of the service and pick up a special gift bag we have just for you. We'd like to take a few moments to tell you about some things coming up for you and your family at Bonita Valley. Bonita Valley's Faith and Fitness Ministry wants to invite you to a new fitness opportunity on Friday nights called CrossBox. CrossBox mixes boxing techniques with cardio for a great workout that will improve your stamina, relieve stress, and help develop muscular endurance all while burning calories. Men, women, and youth ages 14 and up are welcome. A donation of $5 is suggested. This limited time class will happen every Friday from February 16th to March 22nd from 6 to 7 p.m. in the Life Center Gym. Are you looking to get some cardio into your weekly schedule while having fun in a safe environment? Dance Fit is designed with all that in mind. Plus, you get to have a great time with other believers. It happens every Monday at 6 p.m. in the Life Center Gym. How do I grow as a Christ follower? How do I study the Bible? What does prayer look like? These are a few questions that will be answered in Base Class 201, Moving Toward Maturity. 201 gives us four essential habits we need to grow and develop as a believer. It happens Sunday, March 3rd from 5 to 7.30 p.m. in the Life Center. A casual meal and child care will be provided. Sign up online at bindavalley.com slash base class. Baptism is an act of obedience and a public statement that we believe and belong to Jesus. Our next opportunity for water baptism will be Sunday, February 25th at 1 p.m. in the Life Center. A required baptism class will happen February 21st after our Wednesday night service at 8.15 p.m. in the Worship Center. To sign up, stop by BonitaValley.com slash baptism.
We believe God has entrusted us to be managers of our time, talent, and treasures. We believe he wants us to use temporary resources to make a real and eternal difference in our world. And that's what giving at BVCC is all about. When we give to God, we see lives change and transform, both others and ours. There are three ways to give at BVCC. Online at bonitavalley.com slash giving, by texting Bonita Valley to 833-303-9325, or by mailing your offering to BVCC 4744 Bonita Road, Bonita, California, 91902. During our Sunday services, we offer a professionally staffed nursery that will lovingly care for your little one up to two years of age. We also offer an outdoor patio area and a family room with TV monitors for parents who choose to keep children under two years of age with them. Pastor Davida and her team lead incredibly fun ministries for preschool and elementary aged children in the Life Center Gym. Bonita Valley Youth also hosts classes at 9 and 11 a.m. for students in middle and high school in the Fireside Room. During today's service, you can take notes, sign up for events, and even give using your smartphone. Simply use the Follow the Service QR code located in the seat pocket in front of you. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. Here's Purdy on first down. Late blitz coming. In trouble. Purdy stays up on his feet somehow and now throws it and has a completion. How in the world did that work? Fletcher coming. Gets deck throws and it's caught by Samuel. Purdy over the middle and Samuel in stride and Debo Samuel. Purdy in some trouble. Escapes. Looking for the first down. He's got it anymore. Thinking about running for it. Not going to get there. Back across his body. Oh! One-handed catch! Pressure now on Mahomes. He's in trouble. Now gets it away. Are you kidding me? Turning the corner. Fires downfield. Caught. Touchdown. Only Mahomes. It is caught by Kelsey. Touchdown. Kansas City. The play. to God. Um, he, he's given us this opportunity. First of all, I want to give God the glory. I mean, my Christian faith plays a role in everything that I do. I mean, I always ask God to, to lead me in the right direction and let me be who I am uh, for his name. So it has a role in everything that I do. And obviously, it will be on the huge stage in the Super Bowl that he's given me. And I want to make sure I'm glorifying him while I do it. Who's ready for Super Bowl Sunday? Yeah. All right. I want to start this morning off. I don't want to be unnecessarily divisive. I'm not trying to say anything mean about these teams that are playing. But if you, like me, and every other good Christian in California are not rooting for the 49ers, what are you doing? Church is a place where we want to keep our unity, but, but really, I prayed about this. 49ers over the Chiefs, 30 to 27. I recommend Chiefs fans have a t box of tissues near your couch because you're going to need it. The Lord is with Brock Purdy this year. That's how I'm, I'm feeling about it. And I also want to say uh, next year, Next year, I, I have this feeling that a team called the Chargers, I'm guaranteeing that they win it. I guarantee it. Mark my words, next year, Jim Harbaugh, Justin Herbert, win it. It's going to happen. The Padres will never win it. They will never win it. I pray for them. I love them. But don't get your hopes up. It's probably not going to happen. 
Uh, I love winning. I grew up a, a competitive kid. I'm the son of a competitive man. I'm the son of a mother who says she's not competitive while being the most competitive one in the entire family. <laughs> My sister has no hope of winning anything against any of us because we are winners. We're going to win. So she's still working on winning things, but, but we love her anyways. I love winning. I grew up a 1990 Chicago Bulls fan. I have six imaginary championship rings with Michael Jordan. I love winning. In the 2000s, I was a Lakers fan. I watched Kobe Bryant win five rings with the Lakers. Those are Christians clapping. The rest of you don't know what you're doing, but... I love winning. I hate losing. Winning is so much fun. Losing, losing stinks. I love, I love winning. I love watching my teams win. I, I pray for my teams. I root for my teams. I watch my teams on the TV. I'm there. I'm winning with them. We win these championships together. That's the way that it works. I love winning. The question for us today is, do we know when we're living, when we're winning in life? Do we know how we're scoring points in life? Do we know when we are ahead or when we are behind? Because just like in a game, you might know you're winning or losing, but in life, we need to know what winning looks like because it's so important and so key. The Apostle Paul writes a letter that we call 1 Corinthians to a church in a city called Corinth. And Corinth is a major port city in the ancient world with lots of temples to Greek and Roman gods. It's a big economic center. It's a place where people want to be successful. It's where people want to win. If you're in Corinth, you probably have ambitions of some kind. You're pursuing something big in your mind and in your heart. And the church in Corinth had spiritual ambitions. They wanted deep spiritual knowledge. They wanted to be expert communicators of that knowledge, but they were divided. They literally picked spiritual teams like sports fans to be on. Some of them said they basically picked preachers like teams. Some said, I'm, I'm, I'm of Paul, and some said, I'm of, a, I'm of Apollos. And, and they were not united. They were divided amongst themselves in different spiritual Groups and teams, if you will. This was, a, this was a church of smart people, gifted people, successful people. But they stepped on each other's toes. They got each other's way, especially in church. They wanted to be spiritual. They wanted God to use them. But their efforts were not very effective. In fact, they were chaotic. Because they were missing something. So Paul writes to them and, and gives them things to correct them and, and direct them. And, and in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, he encourages their desire to be used by God, talking about spiritual gifts and abilities that they'd been given, but there was something key missing in their spiritual pursuits and ambitions. So we pick it up at the end of chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12 Verse 31, and Paul says, so you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts, but now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. Another translation says, let me show you a more excellent way. Yes, you desire good things, but you're missing God's best in your life. You're missing God's best in your church. You're missing God's best in your ministry and your pursuits. So Paul is stirring this desire for God's best in their hearts. Do you want good things? Awesome. Do you want to be used by God in powerful ways? Fantastic. But don't miss the best that God has for you. And what is that? Paul gets into it in chapter 13, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians. He says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
if I, if I had the gift of prophecy, if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Three different areas that he, he jumps into as he, he tells us that when the, the secret ingredient of love is missing, something key is missing. Four words that sum it up is this, number one in your notes. Without love, I'm losing. To the Corinthians and to us, whatever we do for God, whatever we do for life that matters to us, if love is not baked into the cake, we are losing. And three different areas that he jumps into. The first, when he talks about the words they use, actually different spiritual and prayer languages. And he says, without love, I'm just noise. I'm like a gong. I'm like a clanging cymbal. He's really saying, you can be annoying without love. And I almost made you put annoying in that blank, but I didn't want to do it to you on Super Bowl Sunday. So noise is in there. I don't know if he's thinking of, of first-year band students. You ever heard a first-year band student practicing for hours? It's just torture. I was a first-year trumpet student. God bless my parents for not murdering me in that year of my life. But there's music that has to be happening, and, and the love brings the music to life. Love brings what we're doing and makes it Get in sync to where it works. And my words without love is just noise. He talks about knowledge. Without love, no matter what knowledge I possess, he says, I'm nothing special. No amount of knowledge by itself is going to make me special to be intellectual or spiritual or maybe I, I got the tea and I'm going to spill it. That means if you're born after, before 1990, it means I'm going to gossip to you. Whatever knowledge I have, I'm not special if I don't possess love with it. He talks about generosity. That no matter what I give and what I do and what I sacrifice, without love, he says, I am spiritually poor. That my, my good works will not pass the test. And they are not worth anything. I don't gain anything from them if love is not a part of what I am doing. So from my words to my knowledge to my sacrifices and my gifts... Without love, he's saying, we are spiritually bankrupt. Interestingly, the Bible, uh, the New Testament is mostly written in Greek, and there's four different words that are used for love in the Greek language. And it's actually a Super Bowl commercial from a few years ago that helps us understand those four Greek words of love, and I want us to go ahead and play it right now. The ancient Greeks had four words for love. The first is philia. Philia is affection that grows from friendship. Next, there's storge, the kind you have for a grandparent or a brother. Third, there's eros, the uncontrollable urge to say, I love you. The fourth kind of love is different. It's the most admirable. It's called agape. Love has an action. It takes courage, sacrifice, strength. For 175 years, we've been helping people act on their love so they can look back or look ahead and say, we got it right. We did good. So agape is the Greek word Paul uses for God's love. 
It's a fatherly love. It's a love that's in action. It's a love that does something. It's a love that, that serves. Number two in your notes, love is more than a feeling. Love is an action, but it's even more than an action. It's the way the action is, is carried out. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, Paul continues to describe what we need to hear and, and learn. He says, love is patient and kind. What does that mean? It means love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. In short, love is Christ-like character. It's, it's maturity. And out of that maturity comes patience and kindness. And, and in this description that he gives between patience and kindness and then jealousy and rudeness and demanding and irritability, it kind of reminds me of seeing a parent with their toddler. A parent demonstrates so much patience with a little one. And a little one can be so difficult sometimes. And they, you made them a certain meal and they don't want to eat that. They want a mac and cheese instead. And as kid gets a little bit older, sometimes you might, might have had a friend, it might have been you, and, and, and you got angry and you ran away from home. Parents don't run away from home. He says love doesn't give up, love doesn't, doesn't lose faith, love endures through every circumstance. Love is a sign of maturity. Love is developed in, in a heart that has grown up and has patience and kindness for those who need it the most. First John 4, 8 says, but if a person isn't loving and kind, it shows that he doesn't know God. For God is what? Love. God is love. It says of Jesus that his name was Emmanuel, God with us. That's why he's the picture of, of love for us. But Paul in this text is giving us a measuring stick for love. He's giving us a way to test love. If you want to test your love, you have to look at your why and your how. Why am I doing this? What is my motive? What is my real reason? Why do I say the nice things that I say? There can be more than one reason that I do. I might do it for, for acceptance, because of rejection. I might do it for attention. I might, I might desire to be seen. I might, I might do it for admiration. I want to be admired. There's all kinds of reasons and ways that we do and say things. But if my motive is not love, my actions are not either. And how do I know my true motive? What is a test for my motives? Jesus gives us a repeating test in Matthew chapter 6 before he teaches the Lord's Prayer. He talks about a number of things, fasting and praying and spiritual things that we may do. And he's talking about the Pharisees and certain people who do things in public to be seen. And he says they do it to be seen and that's their reward. They wanted attention. They wanted admiration. But if you do these things and you go into, when you pray in private, you do things that are unseen to your father who is unseen, he will reward you. Your motives are pure when you're not seeking attention for the loving things that you try to do, for the faith, spiritual things you try to do. My motive is seen in whether I'm looking for attention, I put it on display or not. If I'm having prayer time and I set up my camera and I video myself and I put it on, on my Instagram story, I'm trying to be seen. 
There are things that the Bible, Jesus teaches us, that you do things not to be seen, not to be on display, not to show off, not for attention and admiration. And God rewards us when we do those things with the right motive. Real love is seen in my motive. If my motive isn't love, my actions aren't either. Next, if my way isn't loving, my actions aren't either. It's not just looking for attention. There's a, a kindness that God wants us to have and how we go about doing what we do. First John 4, 8 uses the words loving and kind. Paul says patient and kind. As we grow in love, we should be growing in kindness. And our way should be kind. And when it is, then our action is loving. But when my way is not loving, my action is not loving either. And, and Paul again describes things that love are not. Love's not jealous. Love's not boastful. Love's not proud. It's not rude. It's not demanding my own way. It's not irritable. It's not holding grudges. He's naming things they were doing that they need to, to correct and put an end to. The essence of unloving ways is self Centeredness, me first mentalities, spoiled attitudes, me, 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 my way. In God's kingdom, I become more loving the less I think about myself. If what we do and what we say is not done in kindness, then our action does not pass the test of love. And then Paul makes this point, that real love does not quit. Real love passes all the tests of life. And life throws lots of tests at us. Difficulties, changes, things we did not expect, things we didn't want, things we didn't plan for, storms. Love weathers all the tests, all the storms. I believe Paul is helping us understand this, that love is tough. That love might be the toughest thing on earth because love does not quit. Verse seven, love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through some circumstances. All circumstances. Love follows through. Love does not bail out. Love is not flaky. Love's not waiting for a better thing to show up and then I'm out. This looks better. This looks more interesting. Sorry, I'm not there for you anymore. Love passes the test. Through all the tests, love still stands because it's tough. It's not weak. That is what love is for us to understand. Number three today, acts of love last forever. So important for us to know that the Bible teaches us this, that what we do in love is eternal and has eternal consequences, eternal rewards. First Corinthians 13, eight, 10, and 13 says, so he's talking about spiritual gifts, he says, all the special gifts and powers from God will someday come to an end. But love goes on how long? But when we have been made perfect and complete, this means when we have been, when we are in eternity, when we've been given eternal bodies, we have been resurrected with Jesus, we are in, in a heavenly state, then the need for these inadequate special gifts will come to an end. Prophecy will come to an end. All kinds of things will come to an end. They will disappear. Verse 13, there are three things that remain. Faith, hope, and what? And the greatest of these is love. The things you do, the actions you take, where faith was there and hope was there and love was there, those actions will last forever. In heaven, you'll be so happy about the things you do where these things were at place in the midst of what you did and the actions that you took. 
Did you know in heaven that you'll be rewarded for your acts of love? Did you know in heaven you'll be rewarded for your acts of kindness and ministry and serving? And your life will literally be tested for it in heaven. And if it's, if it's found in your life, you will be given eternal heavenly rewards because of it. You win. 1 Corinthians 3, 2, 12 through 15. He's speaking about the lives we are building on the foundation that is Jesus. He says, but there are various kinds of materials that can be used to build on that foundation that is Jesus. Some use gold and silver and jewels. What did we read a minute ago? Faith, hope, and love. Then he says, some build with sticks and hay or even straw. Anybody giving somebody a bundle of straw for Valentine's Day this, this Wednesday? I hope you're not. They're going to break up with you. <laughs> Sticks, hay, or straw do not survive the test of fire. But gold, silver, and jewels do. Verse 13. There's going to come a time of testing at Christ's judgment day to see what kind of material each builder has used. Everyone's work will be put through the fire so that all can see whether or not it keeps its value and what was really accomplished. Verse 14, then every workman who has built on the foundation with the right materials and his work still stands will get his pay or his reward. Verse 15, but if the house he has built, meaning the life that we, that we live, the life we built, burns up, he will have great loss. He himself will be saved. He'll be in heaven, but like a man escaping through a wall of flames as everything goes down. You will be so happy in heaven when the moment comes and you see your life and you see the moments where you did things with faith and hope and love. And the things that you didn't do, you're going to go, ah. We will be rewarded. The greatest of these, he says, is love. Love, acts of love, last for how long? Forever. They will be in eternity forever. And the rewards we get in, in, in heaven, they will not collect dust. Anybody, everybody wonder where the dust comes from in your house? I vacuum the dust and dust always comes back. There's no dust in heaven. You don't lose stuff in the garage in heaven. Those rewards will be with you forever. Here's what I believe God is saying to us today. We might love winning, but we win by loving. The key to winning in life is loving. This is why Paul says, 1 Corinthians 14, 1, let love be your highest what? Why? Because we win by loving. Living Bible says this way, let love be your greatest aim. The main target we're shooting for every day, every week, every year is to be more loving in our actions, in our lives, because we win by loving, both on earth and in heaven. Last thing, number five, if I want to win more, I have to love more. If I want more winning spiritually in my life, i got to love more. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, we're coming to the last chapter of, of 1 Corinthians. He says, let what? Let some of what you do. Let a little bit, let, let the most of what you do, let everything you do be done in love. What does this mean? Motivated and inspired by God's love for us. God loved us first through Jesus, through the cross, through his sacrifice. Let his love inspire us to do more acts of love and kindness in our lives. Living Bible puts it this way. And whatever you do, do it with kindness and love. You want to win more? Love more. Acts of love last forever.
He's calling us to make love our motive, to make kindness our way. Do we just flip a switch from whatever we've been or whatever we're doing to become more loving? No. There's a couple things that we can do. First of all, we need to confess where we have been unloving. How do we become more loving? We confess where we have been unloving. God, here's where I've been irritable. God, here's where I've been rude. God, here's where I have been focused on me demanding my own way. God, here's where I've been boastful, proud, jealous of others. Lord, here's where I've held grudges, where I've been unforgiving. God, I've sinned in these ways. Forgive me of these things. I want more love in my life. The first step is we confess where we have come up short of the target of our aim. And then secondly, how do we become more loving? We clothe ourselves in my new spiritual nature. Colossians 3.10. He says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Put on your new nature. We all need something new happening to us and within us to become that new person that we want to be. It's funny, culture is saying more and more, the key is to be your authentic self. Be your authentic self. Express your authentic feelings. What happens when your authentic self stinks? What happens when your feelings stink? What about when you're rude and you're demanding and you're holding grudges and you're flaking on people and you're jealous and you're boastful and you're irritable? Be your authentic self. No thanks. I don't want your authentic self. That's what it is. It's not what the Bible says. You're not God. You should not always express how you feel and what you think. Nobody wants that. Uh, the believer, what we say, what the Bible says is we put on our new spiritual nature. What is that nature? It's Jesus. Galatians 3.27 says, This is because all of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You have put him on as if he were your what? Your clothes. In prayer, you can say, Jesus, I'm, I'm clothing myself in you today. I'm clothing myself in your attitudes and your mindset and your loving kindness. As I study Jesus and his attitudes and, and how he is, I'm putting him on. As I'm focusing on Jesus, I am putting him on. And I'm, a new nature is taking root in my heart and growing in my life. And the parts of me that stink are going away. The parts of me that are unloving are, are shriveling away. As I confess where I've been unloving and as I'm clothing myself in the nature of Jesus. And what are we inspired by? We're inspired by God's love for us. John three sixteen says, for God so loved Amplified Bible shows us that so means greatly. God so loved. It doesn't say that God, God loved you. You can, say, you can say, I love you. I, I, I love you. But if you say, I, I so love you, that sounds weird. When you say so, you got to say it enthusiastically. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten son so that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish but shall live forever in eternal life with him. God so loves you and God so loves me. And if I want more and more of God's love in my life, then I love others the way that he loves me. We are inspired by God's great love. We are inspired by, by what Jesus did on the cross to pay for our sins, to give us eternal life, forgiveness, the cleansing of our hearts. 
God loved so greatly. And, and that's what inspires the love that we have for others. I want to ask us to bow our heads for a moment in prayer. And there's just two things I want to do in prayer with you. Right now, what I want to ask you just to do is, is just in your own heart between you and God, just, just, just confess to God right now. God, here's, here's, I, I know I was irritable here. God, I can see I've been rude here. God, I can see I've been too demanding and I, I, I've, I've been too boastful and proud and jealous and holding grudges. God, I'm confessing to you some of my unloving ways. And I want those ways, I want less of that in my life. And then I wanna ask you to, to pray this out loud with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I receive Jesus as my savior and as my spiritual close. Jesus, I, I clothe myself in you in your attitude, your mindset, your kindness, your selflessness, the way that you served, may I serve. The way that you loved, may I love. I pray these things in Jesus' name.